Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, the NISPAC meeting. Please note that all audience member lines on the phone will remain muted until the various Q&A portions of today's call. We will provide you with instructions on how you may ask a verbal question at that time. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. If you are connected on the web and would like to submit a written question, please locate the chat panel on the right side of your screen, select all panelists from the Send To drop-down menu. And if you require technical assistance, you may send a private note to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the call over to the Director of ISU, Mr. Mark Bradley. Please go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see, it's a, a different venue that we've had in the past. Um, so a couple things. We have Mr. Bradley will give a lot of the administrative items. Uh, I would ask if you are a NISPAC member, because we don't have a lot of microphones, and we were aware of that, but the archives, believe it or not, this is what they had available. Um, so these first two rows in the center, if you are, perhaps we already have all the NISPAC members that are present um, here. So uh, it's ironic. We did this because of safety concerns. Uh, of course, on a day like this, a lot of folks are calling in, but uh, who knew? So I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you. Anyway, decided because the government's still open to go ahead and uh, and do it. So again, we apologize for putting anybody at risk. It wasn't our intent. What I will guarantee you is, though, is that we'll get you out of here on uh, on time. So with that, let's let's get started. Let me just just uh, go through the usual uh, administrative. Uh, Comments. All right. Welcome to the 60th meeting of the NISPAC. As you are aware, we've changed the venue for this meeting from the Archivist Reception Room to the McGowan Theater. As Greg said, we did that because of the uh, fire codes. We were so popular that we were running out of space. And those of you who have been in, in the Archivist Reception Room know it's a beautiful room, but it is compact. And if we did have a crisis, it could be a real crisis. Move it here. This is a bit, uh, takes a bit to get used to. I feel like I'm either under the interrogation of the KGB or, 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 or in Las Vegas, but it, it, you know, the lights are, I, I get to see orbs now, so I'm, I'm not really looking at you, I'm looking at, at, uh, at, at light. So any, anyway, um, we'd like to remind you that this is a public meeting. Uh, it is uh, audio recorded. We are also using WebEx for the first time to expand our reach for enabling access to the meeting. You will notice this change uh, throughout this meeting. So again, don't be taken back by it. This is an experiment for us, us two. We're trying to, again, expand our, uh, our reach. For those of you here in the room, please be mindful that we have people on the phone through teleconferencing capability. And my guess is today we have more than usual uh, uh, people on the phone, so we need to be mindful of them. There are three microphones in the first two rows uh, for members' use. Greg, did you identify what those are? Those are handed out. Yeah, so um, if you, you can, there's, Carolina has one. Okay, got it. There's one on the table, and then Dennis Ariaga has another one. We have a couple on the ends. We have some ISU folks that will help out if members that are not NISPAC members in the audience have a question. Uh, you can either move over to the sides um, at the point where we ask for questions, uh, or we'll try to get one of our ISU folks to get a microphone to you. Okay. All speakers must identify themselves before speaking. As you know, this is recorded and also transcribed. So again, it, in order to make a clear transcript of what, what this is, we need to know who's speaking. Uh, and so again, please identify yourself. And if I interrupt you again, it's not because I'm rude, it's because I'm trying to get a, an accurate transcript of, of who said what to whom and what the answers were. <clears throat> the presenters will address a uh, variety of topics today. At the end of each presentation, we will have a small question and answer session in which each uh, which people may ask questions as well as submit questions through WebEx. The way it will work is after a speaker has completed their, uh, has completed their presentation, I will ask for anyone in the audience, meaning those of you present in the room, if you have any questions. After answering those questions, I will then ask Tanya Chinji, our WebEx moderator for the, for the meeting, for this meeting, if any questions were submitted through the WebEx chat function. If there are, Carolina, uh, Carolina Klink of my staff will read the question so that everyone can hear it. 
Last, uh, Tania will unmute the phone lines and ask if anyone calling in has a question. Please remember that there will be a general uh, question and answer session at the end of the meeting, and I will encourage you to take advantage of that. Presenters, other than those sitting here at the table who don't have slides, must use a podium at the front of the theater. Robert Tringali of my staff will assist those uh, to use their presentations on the screen. Presenters will also have access to a remote where they can move the slides uh, at their own leisure. So again, whatever you all prefer. Some other additional administrative notes. We'll have a 10-minute break during the middle of the meeting. The location of the restrooms, when you exit the theater, they will be on the left side once you enter the hallway, as is the NARA Cafe. Also, for those with mobility issues, to my right in front of the stage is a door that leads to an elevator which will transport you to the ground level. Regret regrettably, regret regrettably, food and drink are not allowed in the theater, despite what you're seeing here in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to welcome our newest NISPAC members and express our appreciation for our, our outgoing members. First, I'd like to recognize Quentin Wilkes, who will now serve as our NISPAC industry spokesman. Quentin has served in this pack in many capabilities for many years and has proved himself to be more than up to this new challenge. We know that he will continue to make great contributions to the NISPAC and thank him for serving as the industry spokesman. So well, pleasure to have you. We also have two new members from industry. First, it's a great pleasure that I introduce uh, Ms. Roselle Borio, who is the Senior Information Security Officer at INSCO, Inc. It's also a great pleasure that I introduce Ms. Cheryl Stone, who serves as a Director of Corporate Security for the Round Corporation. We are greatly looking forward to having you as members and sharing your thoughts and insights. Our newest government members are Christine Gunning, who I used to work with over at the Department of Justice. We welcome and thank you for your willingness to participate. Mike Scott, primary member of the Department of Homeland Security, we welcome you and thank you for your willingness to participate. Our outgoing members are Anna Harrison, primary member of the Department of Justice, now succeeded by Christine. Grateful for what Anna has, uh, has done for us. Steve Lynch, uh, Department of Homeland Security. Thanks, Steve. Heather McMahon, uh, Department of Defense. We're grateful for her service. And uh, we have here today is her, uh, her uh, alternate. What do you say back up? But that's, that's, not, that's not quite right. Now, beginning with the table, I'd like uh, each person to introduce him or herself, followed by the NISPAC members in the first two rows. Uh, next, remaining persons in the theater, and last we will go to the ones on the phone. For those calling in, uh, they will receive a prompt from Tania, and at that point they will introduce themselves. In this way, we will be able to provide people calling in and identifying themselves at the same time. Also, we would like to ask those on the phone to follow up with an email to Robert Tringali at robert.tringali, that's T-R-I-N-G-A-L-I, -I at nara.gov. Right, Greg? Right? Yeah. Yep. So, I'm Mark Bradley, uh, Chair of the uh, NISPAC. Quentin Luke. Greg Pannoni, ISU, and a designated federal official for the NISPAC. Valerie Heil, Department of Defense. Bob, do you want to start? Keith Minor, Defense Security Service. Carolina Klink, ISU. Bob Harney, NISPAC. George Ladner, CIA. Dennis Keith, NISPAC. Dennis Ariaga, Industry. Kim Barger, State Department. Christine Gunning from the Department of Justice. Rosal Barrero, Orozzi, NISPAC. Kevin Casey, ISU. Glenn Clay, Navy. Fred Gortler, Defense Security Service. Excuse me, Bob Scarrat. Could you grab the other microphone and Sheldon Saltis, this uh, NBIS. Patrick Hogan, DSS. Cheryl Stone, NISPAC. Steve DeMarco, DOD CAF. Carl Hellman, DSS. Steve Mapes, DSS. Bob Lilge, Industry. Ila Hubelby, Industry. Mark Riddle, ISU. Jim Irvin, DHS. Mike Scott, DHS. Justin Doubleday, Inside Defense. Jane Dingle, Industry. 
Sue Steinke, Industry. Merle Matchett, Industry. April Abbott, Industry. Leandro Motor, Industry. Uh, Jason Elder, DOD, OUSDI. Donna McLeod, MBIB. John Eskelson, MBIB. Brian Mackey, Industry. Caroline Ducati, Clearance Jobs. Lisa Reedy, Industry. Dick Weaver, Industry. Uh, Jason Hager, Public Services and Procurement Canada. Tomas Simon, DSS. Chris Forrest, DSS. Andrew Parker, DSS. John Massey, DSS. Dan Finucane, DSS. Amanda McLean, DOD. Jason Steinauer, DSS. Sandy Day, NBIB. Bert Covington, CIA. All the phone lines have been unmuted, so if you're on the phone, can you please identify yourself and your agency? To our first caller, please go ahead and identify your line. Carla Peters, Car Industry. David D'Souza, Industry. Diane Rayner, Industry. Shirley Brown, NSA. Stephen Cicerelli, Industry. Catherine, please go ahead. Your line's unmuted. Okay, Kathy Ferson, Industry. Larry Piles, Defense Security Service. Larry Piles. De Laura Agnum, DSS. <laughs> Allison Renzello, DSS. Rick Olmacher, Industry. Sharon, please go ahead. Your line's unmuted. Sharon Domlinger, Air Force. Jennifer Skelton, Air Force. And to the other speakers on the call, please go ahead. Your line's unmuted. Olga, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Olga Delgado, ODNI. Patricia, please go ahead. Patricia Stokes, DSS. Brian, please go ahead. Brian Deloney, Defense Security Service. Sandy Langley, DMDC, supporting this. And finally, Valerie, please go ahead. Valerie Corbin, ODNI. All phone lines have been identified.
And just confirming that all lines have been identified. Not uh, delay then. All right. Greg Pannoni now will address some administrative items and will cover the status of action items in July 19, 2018, uh, in this back meeting. Greg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not going to look up as much either because these lights are kind of tough. Um, so all the presentations and handouts uh, were sent electronically to all the members and to those who provided an RSVP um, to the invitation for the meeting. Uh, if you didn't receive any of these documents, all the materials, along with the final minutes and the official transcript of the meeting, will be posted on the ISU NISPAC website uh, within approximately 30 days. And also for your information, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register uh, approximately 30 days prior to the meeting. So now I'm going to move into the, uh, the action items, read off the action items from our last meeting that was July 19th. Uh, the first was involving industry meeting with DSS to see if they could get more clarity to some of the consultant and security services uh, that continue to support uh, small businesses. Um, so while there has been some informal discussion, the meeting between DSS and industry is still pending. Um, next was uh, DSS and ISU to discuss the directors and secretaries of federal executive branch agencies responsible to implement CUI. Um, we, ISU and DSS, did have a meeting regarding the terms of what will be DSS's role in overseeing the implementation of the CUI program for the Defense Industrial Base, DIB, on behalf of DOD. Uh, as those attended yesterday, DSS has a draft plan that is very close to finalization. Next, NBIT was to provide information on companies that are going to participate in a pilot program. Uh, to put some context on this, if you were here, you may recall from the last meeting, this concerned leveraging industry as a trusted information provider or TIP as appropriate. Uh, some companies already have gathered vetting type information on their new employees, which may supplement the government's vetting program. Part of what is being considered is to establish baselines for what information is generally already being gathered by industry. Mr. Phelan will discuss, I believe, a little bit of this later in his uh, presentation update. Uh, next, the Insider Threat uh, Working Group uh, was to meet before the next NISPAC meeting, and uh, ISU also involved with that would poll NISPAC members to discuss ways to improve the Insider Threat programs. Uh, we did have that meeting on October 30th. Uh, it was a good meeting, productive. Uh, while ISU didn't formally poll members, some informal discussions at the meeting regarding program improvement were discussed, and I will be providing an update on the Insider Threat Working Group meeting later in this meeting. Uh, next, uh, industry requested a debrief from ISU on the meeting held with the CSAs and other government activities on the processing of NIDs. Uh, Due to business exigencies, the meeting was not held, but we will be doing that sometime in the next few months. Uh, next, ISU inquired about uh, what the obstacle to obtaining sponsorship for EMAS training is and who is the authority for sponsorship. Um, I believe yesterday some of this was discussed as well. Um, DSS stated that if an industry partner is unable to access the EMAS training site, after being sponsored for access by their local ISSP, they should report this to DSS at the following email address, dss.quantico.dss.mbx.emas at mail.mil. Uh, more detail on this will be addressed later during the NISA working group update that Carl Hellman will give. Uh, next, I believe this is the last one. Um, this one, the wording in the minutes is, is actually not quite right. Uh, this was about uh, why some companies have been receiving notices that disestablishes their ATOs uh, authorizations to operate. Uh, DSS stated that denial of authorization to operate letters are used by DSS to inform industry of the removal of the ability to operate. These letters are produced for a variety of reasons, as you may know, 
Uh, could be expiration of the ATO, increased risk to classified information not previously known, change of security staff, security violations, unable to meet NIST RMF standards, and others. Each DATO is an independent decision associated with the specific. So that's a readout on the old action items. Are there any questions? Questions back to you, Mr. Chair. All right. Go to our reports and updates uh, section of our program. The first chair for National Background uh, Investigations, Head Charlie, Charlie Bale. Charlie, please come on. what you mean about the lights. Um, I seem to recall earlier in my career I would have been on the other side of those lights. Um, anyway, we'll do what we can here. So thanks for a few minutes to chat with you all this morning. Um, I uh, went back and looked at what uh, I had uh, said when I was here with you all back in, uh, in the spring and I uh, wanted to get a sense of what promises I had made and how far we had come with some of those things. And one of the, 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 essentially what I said is based on our inventory in the spring and what the things that we were doing, I had predicted that by Thanksgiving we would be down about 15% in our inventory. Um, I'll give you a little bit more on numbers in a minute here, but uh, as of uh, Monday, we were down 13%. And give me two more weeks after Thanksgiving, I hope to be able to tell you that 15% is actually accurate. Uh, in other news, and I mean that in all senses of it, there have been some uh, media reports that have gone both ends of the spectrum here. There was a couple of reports out last week that suggested that my inventory was extraordinarily high, much higher than it really is. At the same time, uh, there was an article that, re that reflected that the uh, principal deputy director of national intelligence had predicted that I would have an extraordinarily low inventory by the springtime of uh, that I think. So I've got a lot of people telling me what they would hope that I would do or what their numbers look like. But let me give you a real sense of what those numbers look like here. Uh, as of uh, Monday, the reality is that our total inventory of investigations sits at about 630,000. That is, as I said before, 13,000, I'm sorry, 13 percent, uh, almost 100,000 less than it was in the springtime. Um, I think more importantly for, for this organization, particularly for this, this, uh, um, this discussion, is um, the notion of how, in that population, how many of these folks are awaiting an initial clearance, or in other words, may or may not be able to be working it. So let me just break down those numbers. In the, uh, in the Tier 3 population, the secret clearance population, the total number of, in our inventory of initials is 190,000. Uh, of that number, 35,000 are in industry. Uh, taking it to the next level, the Tier 5 investigations, uh, we are showing 90,000 in our inventory, in the Tier 5 initials, not the investigations, initials, at 90,000, and about 25,000 of those are in industry right now. So you add all those numbers up, uh, that's about 280,000 initial investigations that we're processing right now and some, some part of that continue. Uh, but that is not 280,000 people that are not working. Uh, based on the numbers we have, at a minimum, about 114,000 of that 280,000. And that's, we don't have in, insight into every agency's um, uh, interim clearance process, but those are the ones we can document. 114,000 of that 280,000 are at work on an interim clearance. Um, and so um, that's not as bad a number as some other been out there. It's still not where we want it to be, but uh, uh, it's not been. Uh, and, and specifically, the industry inventory itself, we can, we can show is itself down by 13% since just since June, based on some things I'll talk about in a few minutes here. Uh, the other uh, piece of this thing, which uh, really is uh, um, at, at the root here, is timeliness. How long does it take to do clearances? I see behind me is some numbers here that look extraordinarily unhappy. I am unhappy with the numbers as well. They aren't. Um, two, two factoids here that may help a little bit. One is that what we are seeing in the range of those times for clearances, you know, we don't count them until they're actually finished. What we are seeing is, the, is what was fairly narrow range that everything was coming in late. We're seeing a lot of stuff come in sooner, but at the same time we're closing on a lot of old stuff. And so the averages come out still about the same. I expect that as, as we get moving down this uh, inventory number that those timeliness, timeliness numbers will go down. 
a leading indicator of this is an arcane number that we use in our, our key our production and, um, information called field man hours. It's, I wouldn't worry too much about what that defines, but it, it essentially tells us how many field, how much field work is sitting out in our inventory. And field work, you guys know, is the longest poll and attempt investigations. That number is down about 35 percent since last since last spring. And that's a good leading indicator where we think these numbers are going to be going here. So stay tuned. I hope to be able to come at our next session, which is January, maybe, um, and give you some better numbers here. March. Okay. I should mention really good numbers by then. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, so what's getting us there? Um, I've hashed this out before, but really quickly here, we've rebuilt our investigative capacity. We're up to 8,800. 8, people that are doing field investigations for us right now, in addition to all the other folks that are working. Uh, that population has gained experience over the last six months. Uh, and more importantly, we have put on top of that a lot of our business process reengineering things, which are using these investigators far more effectively than we had been in the past. I'm just going to touch on, on one here uh, that you all are probably familiar with, is our, our work on that is putting our investigators in, in hubbing situations geographically so that we asked and some of your companies have volunteered to be the footprint for us. Uh, we did this with the government uh, a few times, uh, government organizations, whether it was um, Department of Energy, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, Department of Defense at large, and, uh, and some other organizations. It's worked out pretty well. Our first two hubs with industry, which were, quote, pilots, we're going mainstream with this stuff now. We pick a geographic location. One of you has hosted us, but every company in the area is welcome to come. allow us to spend less time administratively while the people that we are doing the investigations on and the references come and talk to us. In addition, we're giving these folks some technology that we had, you know, if you guys are security officers, you know we're scared to death of things like VTCs. We're actually using that stuff and using it in a secure manner and extending our reach considerably here. That's all helping. <clears throat> um, again, when we go to these hubs, all companies in the area are invited, and uh, we'll make sure that we are uh, working on that stuff. The uh, um, couple other pieces, I think either Valerie or, or Olga may talk about this when they get to the DNI stuff, but we are working on trusted workforce, uh, the key element of trusted workforce 2.0, which is rewriting the uh, policies that are driving how we do investigations. Um, this is really picking up steam. Uh, in the last three weeks, we've had an awful lot of, of, of energy into this thing at the, from the executive uh, steering group. Uh, we've been working off some of the early decisions from this, and that has also helped with our inventory reduction. So all this stuff working together has been helpful. Uh, Greg mentioned uh, the Trusted Information Provider Program. Uh, it's sort of a no-brainer that I know a lot of you in, in the uh, pre-employment portion of, of uh, bringing people on board are gathering information that we can use later in an investigation. There's no point in us going back out and recollecting that information if we can trust that you've, you have gotten it from a, a reliable source. We've been working with a number of your companies in a working group situation. Of, uh, we have put together a draft of how this would work. A lot of that comes from information provided by you. I have seen, we know there's enthusiasm within our security executive agents to both the suitability and security executive agents, I'm sorry, to uh, both for changing the policy and allowing us to broaden this out considerably. Uh, and uh, the front end of this is, of course, doing some pilots. And we're, we've got a lot, of, a lot of enthusiasm for that, too. So I envision this will come mainstream pretty quick. So I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, last topic here is changing t-shirts. Uh, last spring, uh, Michelle Sutphin said, after I talked about some of the things we're doing, are you going to share all these sort of cool things that you're doing with the Defense Security Service? when they do the 70-30 split. And so the answer then was yes. The answer today is um, even better. It's we will be DOD in some period of time. Uh, and so yes, we'll be sharing with ourselves. Uh, and uh, just a, a quick uh, highlight here. Uh, back in, in uh, June, the administration published uh, the President's management agenda about the uh, understanding that it made no sense to cut up the investigative organizations into pieces, but to keep it intact and move it from the Office of Personnel Management into the Department of Defense. And that uh, is still the plan. We're waiting for the executive order. Um, it will be imminent. I know I've been saying that for several months, but it will be coming out imminently. I've seen the last draft literally yesterday evening. Really, really close on this. Uh, and uh, um, uh, But it will start with that executive order. And uh, once that happens, we will work in earnest to get through, uh, through that change of, uh, of uh, venue. But that said, we've been working very closely with the Department of Defense. Um, 
basically since last December on some version of a transition. And uh, as I would say, the level of effort and engagement is both high and strong. It's pretty collegial given uh, given the fact of all the stresses and pressures that come into this stuff. It, uh, we really are looking at this as we, we are, will be one team, and uh, I hate speed bumps, and we're going we're gonna to iron those things down as much as possible. Uh, and so with that, um, I leave it open for any questions. If you see your hand go up, that'll be exciting. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Dennis Keith, Ms. Pack. Uh, the decrease in the number of field work hours, does that have anything, uh, is there any correlation there between that and the increased use of CE? Not yet. Um, the number of, uh, we didn't go into a lot of details about, about using continuous evaluation to su supplement some of the uh, periodic reinvestigations of the department is working on it, but the total number of investigations affected by that right now um, is maybe 10. And uh, those are those are avoidance at this point, not not taking things out of the inventory, it's things that were not put into the inventory. That said, um, because everybody's active out there, we are actually still we are seeing consistently in the last few months a higher level of new work coming in than this time last year. So we're actually working against a higher level of income, in still we're making some good headway against it. So I I expect in the long expect I'm sorry expect in the long run that the a lot more wide uh, use of continuous evaluation in as part of a um, uh, periodic investigation program will have a much more dramatic impact. Yeah. I'm not going to get a microphone. Um, Caroline Degatti, Clearance Job. Um, I was wondering, so if uh, the number that Sue Gordon gave from ODNI that the, by the springtime the number would be around 300,000, what would you say might be a more accurate estimation? Um, I would say probably closer to 500,000, but I'm pretty conservative. Um, so <laughs> I said 15% last year, so let's see what happens. But again, the, and the key thing that I really need to make promises about is how, what will the timeliness look like? And I'm, I'm hoping that timeliness is, is dramatically improved. Mr. Charlie in the audience. No, I do not. However, some people joined after the attendance list, so I'm going to leave them really quick. We have Carla Peters, Carr, David DeSosa, Dennis Brady, Lindy Kaiser, Stephen Cicerelli, Katie Timmons, Diane Rayner, Jen Kirby, and Leonard Moss. Thank you. Anyone on the phone have a question for uh, Charlie? If anyone on the phone would like to ask a question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad at this time. We do have a few questions. Our first caller, your line is unmuted. Yeah, hi, hi, this is Leonard Moss. I just have a question for Charlie on the hubs. Charlie, is there somewhere where you list those hubs so if someone wanted to participate, they would know where to go? Uh, I don't know that we've published a list in the sense of putting it out in, in, the, uh, in the open, but where we are set up a hub, um, I believe and I will ensure that we are reaching out to all the industries that have locations within that hub area, all the companies that have, have locations within that area. Great. Thanks. Our next caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. So, my, hey, it's Wendy Kaiser with Clarence Jobs. So, Charlie, you're talking about me and my awesome reporting on your numbers. So, why is the disparity between what you said today um, and what was in the Secret Act report that I got? So, I, your voice is coming through kind of um, broken up. I assume this is Lindy. Kaiser? It's, Lin it's Lindy Kaiser, your number one fan. <laughs> so, um, I'm wondering about the disparity between the numbers, and you could follow up with me later because I want to make sure I get them right. Because I'm going to report, you know, I'm going to, I'm interested in the numbers that you reported today, but they're different than what was listed in the Secret Act report. So, so Lindy, I, I appreciate that. So we, I went back and read the Secret Act report again as well. So the two things about those numbers. One is they're numbers from June or July, I'm sorry, and not numbers from today. So numbers are different anyway from today. 
The problem with that report is the way we were asked the questions uh, by the legislation that said, please do this report, caused us to write the um, answers the way you see them in the Secret Act. But not all, the, not all those numbers are discrete. There is some cross-checking uh, cross that goes on where, some, where you can get counted the information in that report. And so um, that said, we are going to, we actually have come due uh, very soon, the next, uh, the next quarterly report on that. We're going to put a big caveat on there that says, it, it talks about the math problem with this thing, because if you just look at it and add it up, you get a really high number. But, but these, we're cross-cutting it in different ways and slicing it in different ways. And it, it uh, uh, and the, again, the numbers that I talked today are the accurate numbers. Um, we're going to actually suggest to the, the Hill that we find a different way to way that is much more manageable. But we'll get, Lindy, we'll get back to you more directly you know, and we can talk about that. Awesome. Thank you. No further questions on the call. We've got a comment. Um, I was asked if the speakers can speak closer to the microphone because the sound is faint. because I had an email from, from NASA. The guy had have, have, have been on and they had to get off and try to get back on. Is there some issue with getting back on? That one, please. Well, let's not hold up the meeting. Yeah, anyway. I just let's, let's, let's go. go. Yeah. NASA is still trying to get back on. Maybe thanks, Carlos. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, I'll be here all day or at least until noon. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, we're next going to hear from Ryan uh, Deloney from DSS um, to tell us about the uh, National Industrial Security System and deployment of the NIST. Uh, Good morning. This is Ryan Deloney. Can uh, you guys hear me okay? Go ahead, Ryan. Ryan, your audio is coming through clearly. Okay, great. And I just saw the slides go forward. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I wanted to give an update on the National Industrial Security System. We've had great progress on the NIST effort since last time uh, this group met. I want to note that NIST did successfully deploy on the 8th of October for industry and government users. I want to note that it is the system of record for DSS Industrial Security Oversight, so for the Department of Defense and those non-DOD signatories. Uh, engage with the DOD. ISFD and EFCL are two legacy systems that it replaced. Those are no longer available, so NIST is the system of record to use going forward. You can see some activity notes on there, and following yesterday's meeting with industry, uh, went back and pulled some updated numbers, so I'm happy to share those as well. As of yesterday, we are sitting closer to 6,500 users of which there are about 5,000 unique industry users, uh, 800 government users, and uh, still about 600 DSS users. A uh, question came up about how many companies that represents. Uh, I identified that that represents actually about 5,500 unique cage codes. So there you'll see um, kind of with that number actually bigger than the industry users, there are some users who do represent multiple cage codes, either within their corporate family or there may be a multi-facility FSO. Uh, systems has been heavy in use. Uh, it's currently over actually 13,000 clearance verifications submitted, so a high volume of processing there, uh, which is a good thing. There have been over 400 facility clearance sponsorships submitted. So if you are either a government sponsoring um, an initial or a prime industry partner sponsoring a sub, this is the system you that. Uh, we've seen a lot of benefit with reduced rejection rates. Uh, prior with our very manual process, you would see uh, just with a paper form submitted by email, um, missing documentation and issues that would cause a lag in the initiation of the FCL processing. The smart form in the system is reducing that, ensuring that it, we have a package that has everything we need up front, which has been beneficial. Uh, been over 500 change conditions reported, so industry has been actively using that uh, as required. User feedback has been uh, has been a lot of feedback. I will say that we've received uh, well over a thousand comments, uh, either through our mailbox, which you can see in the bottom right corner on this slide, um, as well as 
uh, directly in system, you can provide that messaging. So we've really seen three main uh, areas. One is folks looking for more training or having questions or needing education. So we've been gathering that up, and as those most common questions arise, arise we've been developing uh, job aids, which we've been sticking directly in system. So on the screen here, you can kind of see a sample dashboard where kind of in that top area, there's the blue links to common functions, questions. We've been providing tool tips, things of that nature. Uh, we're also continuing to build and develop job aids based on user feedback. Uh, there have been many requests for enhancements, which is a good thing, and I'll talk about how we're going to rack and stack and engage with industry and government to prioritize those on the next chart in a moment. And then we have been receiving some bugs. Uh, so on the initial deployment month for a major system like this, that was expected. The development team was in place, uh, mitigated over 30 kind of critical issues up front most of those same day. Uh, and a lot of those, again, came from that feedback. So our initial triage of the feedback was trying to see if any uh, trends and issues that need to be immediately resolved. And that's been worked down to where we're seeing pretty steady system use. Um, looking forward on the training front, there is training available in STEP, uh, the DSS Education uh, Knowledge Portal. So if you go there, there is uh, external training. That is broken by user role. So if you are a sponsor, clearance verifier, uh, on an industry security staff, you can just take those modules unique to you that gives you everything you need. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned already, to the in-system shorts and job aids, those are available as well. Also on the screen here in the bottom right corner are uh, external web page, dss.mil slash is slash nist.html. Uh, we're maintaining that with latest information, FAQs, and resources just to keep pushing that uh, education content available. Next slide. I don't know if there's latency here. I haven't seen the slide push forward on my end, but I'll keep going just in the interest of time. Uh, so key capabilities, industry and government, we did deliver. Uh, as I mentioned, this is where you can submit and track your facility clearance requests. Uh, that's been beneficial. You can see, um, is it under review at our facility clearance branch? Is it um, out with industry to submit the facility clearance package? That's very beneficial. Uh, you know, if you are the sponsor, either as a prime or a government agency, one of the things that can get your people cleared and working fastest is if you see that that company's um, still waiting, pending to submit their required facility clearance documentation. Uh, the sooner that is submitted accurately, the sooner we can uh, initiate all the other activities, uh, the FOCI assessment, uh, clearance initiation as required, on-site surveys in order to get that company up and running. So that's beneficial. Uh, clearance verifications has been going very well. We've been seeing a lot of positive feedback on that. The system is much more proactive. It's been it, uh, uh, it's an easier form to submit those, and as mentioned, well over um, 10,000 of those have been submitted, so that just goes to uh, speak to that note as well. And then those automated notifications, be it uh, whether you're involved in the clearance process, so once your facility is cleared at the interim or final level, the sponsor and company do get emails, uh, updates on that information, as well as uh, if you have clearance verifications running, if there are changes, you'll get emails along those lines. Um, industry, this is where they submit their facility clearance documentation as reference, change conditions, uh, required annual self-inspection certifications. And they also have more transparency into the information in order to view their facility profile, uh, DSS content available, um, that we kind of maintain the records on those companies. Um, so making sure that that's transparent. Where we're going in FY19, we will be using this for the PSI projection survey that was prior done in EFCL, but with this system replacing that, that capability will be uh, deployed out sometime early 2019. Uh, we are looking to update the system to further allow industry to provide updates for their profile and vulnerability mitigation. Again, getting off of our current email process, uh, so as, as there are any issues or information requests, all those are just handled in system um, just to streamline and ensure accuracy. We'll also be looking at DSS and translation, uh, DSS and transition related functions. Uh, some of those are currently done by out of the out of system uh, email and other capabilities spreadsheets. 
we want to automate and streamline as much of that as possible to improve it for everybody. We are look, looking at how we can enhance system reporting, uh, be it suspicious contact reports or security violations, both to receive better information up front about the who, where, when, why of those types of incidents, as well as be able to report more timely and rapid information both to the company and the data owner in the government. So we're working on building those out in FY19 as well. Key point as well, we're working to establish a NIST Operational Requirements Committee. So as I mentioned, we are receiving a lot of feedback for enhancements. Uh, we've been doing some initial triage of that, but what we're really looking to do is gather participants from industry, from government, from DSS to take a look at that backlog, uh, rack and stack and prioritize as a, as a community, and then start delivering upon those capabilities with initial development uh, with an agile methodology starting out in FY uh, early calendar year 19, sometime in late January is when we're looking to get that going. So we're currently finalizing that process. Uh, we'll be looking to gather participants in the month of December to then start uh, those meetings to prioritize in January. So we look forward to participation, um, leveraging uh, uh, NCMS, NISPAC, and uh, government stakeholders groups, leveraging those types of vehicles to gather participants for that organization. And with that, that does kind of run through the big summary. Uh, some other questions that came up yesterday that I'll just go ahead and jump ahead of. Um, as far as if there are any access issues, so you do access the system through InCase, uh, which is a separate application that DSS hosts. It's a single sign-on portal. Um, if you're having any issues accessing that, call our call center. Um, which is available, their numbers on the NCASE webpage. They have a full OCIO trained team to provide that support for access. If there are any broader um, kind of agency level access issues, I know we've been working a couple issues with uh, non-DOD signatories ensuring that their certificates can work with NCASE. We do have a process to escalate those up to direct to the NCASE PM. Um, so if there are any issues there, uh, feel free to send an email to dss.nif at mail.org work to escalate and make sure those get resolved. Um, for the more systemic issues, if it's just a one-off individual, our Knowledge Center has been providing great support. As far as turnaround time for accounts, the government side of the house should be quite rapid. Uh, those go to our Knowledge Center, which has a full team reviewing. Those should be within a few days. Um, on the industry side of the house, as mentioned yesterday, those do go to your industrial security representative. Uh, that can be same day, uh, or if your industrial security representative may be out, um, an assessment or something like that may take a couple days. Um, always recommend you can send an email to your rep when you do submit that, just letting them know that that's there in their queue, um, just to help remind and prompt, and then it'll get that worked as well. Um, the main technical issue we've seen currently that we're working is uh, there is some system latency. So we've seen as people submit their sponsorship, uh, SCL package, et cetera, uh, it may spin for a little while. Um, that is our top priority to work and fix right now. Uh, we have dedicated teams really working full bore on that. So we have a uh, enhancement for that coming out. We're testing that at the end of the month for deployment in mid-December, and you should see much improvement on that front. And with that, uh, I think that covered a lot of the questions that came up, but I would be glad to take any additional questions on this that the group may have today. Anybody on the uh, WebEx? No, but we found the issue of Nelson and she's on the line, so Daya Taylor. And if anyone on the phone would like to ask a question, please press pound two at this time. There are no questions on the phone. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Ryan, we appreciate it. Sure, so thank you. We're here from Sandra Langley from DMDC, who will now provide us with an update on the deployment of the Defense Information Systems for Security. Sandra is calling in. So, Sandra, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Right. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, so I um, want to provide an update on where we are with the deployment of this to industry, give you some information on user provisioning, and ask for assistance 
in continuing the efforts for, for user provisioning. And then to remind you that there are, will continue to be a need for access to both JPAS and this as we go through a phased deployment approach. So as of October, we completed building disk phase one, which means from an industry perspective, industry users are being provisioned in disk for use of disk. At this time, we have provisioned, have actively provisioned just over 5,000 users. Just over 5,000 users have been, were auto-provisioned. We are reaching out to those that were not auto-provisioned but within JPAS have an active account manager. We have contacted all but 8% of those users. The 8%, we are still trying to find email addresses so that we can complete this effort. So just over 2,000 have been recently contacted and provided directions on how to submit the PSAR, the DD2962, for user provisioning. I must advise that we are encountering a large rejection rate. Only approximately one-third of those packages are approved. Request that the user read the directions that are provided with them gives a very detailed layout out of the PSAR, what to do and to submit both the training certificates required for user provisioning. DSS will put this information out also for industry, doing a second campaign trying to assist in getting responses for user provisioning. We also have this large group of security management offices that did not have an active account manager in JPAS. Therefore, we're working with DSS on a campaign to contact those security management offices to forward users for provisioning and to do so at such a rate that we can effectively process those requests. So I'm sure that DSS will provide more information as we continue our discussions today but just wanted to advise that we really need assistance in making sure when we send out a campaign requesting user provisioning that the instructions are thoroughly read if there's any questions to ask them up front so that the package will be successfully submitted and provisioned the first time versus having to going through multiple iterations. So in this today, this phase one is all about communication. It allows the security management office to communicate with DSS, the industry group, for subject management. They can do higher, in, within this, you can do hierarchy management, meaning you can define your hierarchy. Same, we'll have to continue to do that in both this and JPAS. Manage your security management office. You will have to maintain a security management office in both DIS and JPAS. And user provisioning. You have to make sure that users are provisioned correctly and maintain their access to both systems. We look forward to working with DSS to do an incremental phase transition from JPAS capabilities to DIS. Currently, within DIS, can claim the subject, make sure that they're associated with the security management office, add or update foreign relatives, foreign travel, and establish an owning and servicing relationships. Also communicating with the industry team. You can, security management officers can submit customer service requests. There are multiple customer service requests that they can submit for communications with the industry team. Beyond that, there is still a need to continue to use JPAS. DSS will provide information as we transition capabilities. It will provide information on continuing use of eCRIP or when that will change. Incident management is one of the first things that we would like to transition from JPAS to DIS. So more information will come out from DSS when we're ready to do that. 
We're not ready to do that immediately because we're looking downrange on interfaces and how we share any information across the department. So as we have finalized our strategy and our plan for transition, more information will come from DSS. So until then, I understand that that is a pain point, but there will be a need to continue to access both JPAS and DISC for the foreseeable future. A any questions for me? Questions for Sandra? This is Kim Rado from the State Department. Um, I'd like to know what is the, is there any plan in the future at any point in time that you're going to brief regarding um, government access to, to this for non-DOD agencies and DOD agencies because you've only mentioned contractors at this point. And that was the last time too that DMDC didn't really address this either at the last meeting. Okay. Okay. So we're, DIS and JPAS are still limiting who will gain access to the system based upon our current processes and the system of record notice. We do support uh, access to the system. Uh, however, predominant use for non-DOD agencies still is through the SI bridge with CVS. Now, you will hear Sheldon talking about our transition of DIS into the NVIS construct, and he may talk more about when we will add additional federal adopters and when additional federal adopters will gain access because of NVIS initiatives. So I do look forward to continuing to partner with NVIS on the way forward for additional federal adopters. I do appreciate the State Department uh, has requested access to the system and we continue to work with you offline. Wouldn't just be, I mean, I know I'm State Department, but it really, I feel like I'm the, the spokesperson for non-DOD agencies. So there's a lot of other agencies that when we have meetings address the same, have the same concerns that they've not really been included in this. So it's not just me, it's a lot of other agencies as well. <laughs> and I do appreciate that, and that's why I believe there's going to be more conversations on the under the Invis construct. And I will be one. Uh, this will be one of many systems, one of three systems currently supported by DMDC that will transition to the Invis construct, and we will be following their lead for federal adopters. I will. I do expect that Sheldon will speak about federal adopters, and I can tell you that we are working currently right now with the Social Security Administration for federal adoption. They recently published a SCORN in the Federal Register there and identifying that our system will be used for adjudicative management and so we'll be working with them. I also expect that Sheldon will talk about the SCORN that is currently published and how that will support federal adopters in the future. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have questions? Please. Okay. Sam, this is Quentin. Um, is it possible that you could set up a meeting in the future with the I, through the ICU office so that you can collaborate with um, all of those non DOD agencies? So the answer is yes. I, there is a campaign underway by DSS for us to be reaching out to our federal partners to have discussions on shared services, what they would like to take advantage of, and getting to know the community better. So yes, we are doing that. I am just one of many partners in that campaign. This is Greg Pannoni from ISA. Just so who would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I take that as a positive, but I'm not clear as to who takes the lead then on establishing such a at least a one. Hey Greg, this is Trisha. Can I can I get a phone line? Can I get in, please? Sure. I don't know who this. Who, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I am I live on the phone? Yes. Oh, great. So this is Trisha says from Director of uh, Defense Vetting Directorate (DSS), uh, who will be assuming the uh, National Background Investigation Mission as soon as that great executive order is signed. Um, and uh, so to answer the questions in the room, the answer is we are the functional requirements lead and therefore all of these questions, whether it be the one that Quinton answered, whether it be the Department of State, 
um, should be coming through the Defense Vetting Office Enterprise Business Office that I will brief on in a few minutes here. And I can give the points of contact and it can be provided to, um, to Robert uh, in the minutes for this meeting so you know who to contact for all of these questions. But we shouldn't be going through DMDC. We shouldn't be going through the National Background Investigation System. They're the IT provider. We should be going through the business office, and that is the Defense Vetting Directorate. Thank you, Tricia, for the clarification. Any other questions? Kelly, is there anyone on the web? Thanks for her. There are no chats on the web. Okay, how about on, on the phones? If anyone on the phone would like to ask a question, please press pound two at this time. No questions on the phone. Okay. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank I'm you. I'm going to hear from... Thanks, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair. I've been asked to, specifically up here, that we speak a little louder into the microphone. We're getting some response from those that are on the line with WebEx. They okay. can't sure. They can't hear us. Sure enough. And up at the podium as well, Robert. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our next speaker will be Shelton Soltis, who will give us an update on the National Background Investigative Investigation System. Shelton Soltis, I'm from DISA, and I work in the NBIS uh, in PMO, PEO. Um, thanks to Tricia for answering the question that was raised about uh, where to go for information about access. Uh, as, as she pointed out, we're providing the IT. Uh, not, not making policy decisions about who gets access or, or, or requirements per se. So uh, a little background about NBIS. NBIS was stood up about two years ago uh, to replace the NBIB legacy BI systems. Uh, and as Sandy pointed out, we are uh, decided uh, about two years ago to use some of the uh, D, uh, DMDC systems that were currently used for vetting inside DOD to give us a jump start uh, moving forward. Uh, those systems are SWIFT, uh, Mirador, and DISS. Uh, if you look at slide, um, these are the current product lines we currently have. Um, some of you might be uh, familiar with position designation, uh, the PDT that NBIB uh, OPM has deployed. We also have what we call e-application uh, subject, which is uh, better, better known as e-app, uh, which is a replacement for the SF86. We have a, another application that we're calling NBIS agency that pairs with that for a replacement for eClip. Investigation management, that will be replacing the uh, current investigation system uh, up at uh, Boyers uh, called PIPS. Uh, and uh, we're moving away from uh, case-centric to person-centric, so we're calling investigation management versus uh, case management. Then we have fingerprint system. As I said, SWIFT is the, uh, the primary DOD system we're, uh, we're adopting for that. And then uh, one of the big things we're doing is automated record checks. Uh, Amirador is our current uh, system for that, and we're, we're enhancing that and moving that uh, into, into the suite of uh, NBIS. Adjudication, uh, that's uh, currently located in this, and that includes e-adjudication, uh, and uh, as well as continuous evaluation, which is another portion of the mirror door that we, are, we, are, we have adopted. Uh, NBIS is a little bit different than most uh, DOD applications. Uh, we are uh, part of the Agile project uh, inside DOD. We're a pilot. We were definitely so, uh, and we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we want to use uh, agile methodology to do the development for, for uh, NBIS. Uh, we didn't feel that uh, the current state of affairs inside uh, the government with uh, the BI program, transition, transfer, that a waterfall methodology would work well. Um, we would probably end up, to, uh, as if you've ever done waterfall, to spend about 18 to two years getting the requirements in a system this large, hand it to a developer, and then the developer gives you something about three years later, and then the users tell you you basically built the wrong, wrong thing. Uh, so uh, we also use an OTA. Uh, to get us on contract as soon as we could uh, as part of the agile, the agile acquisition strategy that we're using. Um, so uh, that explains uh, why we went with Agile and why we went with the OTA. Uh, the challenge we face, as I said, we have a very uh, mobile and changing environment. We have TW 2.0 coming out. We have the transfer, the transition, uh, a lot of movable parts. This is a federal system also. It's not just a DOD system with complex, makes it more complex. We have to meet multiple stakeholders and multiple requirements. Um, so that we can, we can meet, the, meet the requirements for the entire federal government, not just DOD. Um, and we also have a very large project uh, currently. We chose Scrum for our Agile methodology. We have uh, 10 teams working on the IM portion of it. We have a team working on the uh, front end uh, EAP uh, um, 
and uh, e uh, what we call MBIS agency, and we also have a team working on PDT. Um, so we had to come up with a way to manage that across the entire spectrum of all those teams, and we chose the scaled Agile framework um, to, to meet, meet that requirement. Um, as I said, Agile um, is a methodology to produce software faster and, and direct to the user's needs versus building, up, building to documentation. Uh, and we, we're really focusing on providing value to the, to the uh, owner and making sure that we can change and move morph as we need to to meet, the, meet those uh, requirements. Uh, if this is a comparison of the traditional practices of Agile uh, to, uh, to uh, waterfall or other methods, as you see, uh, the traditional um, practice is basically to be predictable. So you have cost schedule performance. Uh, that's the iron triangle that most program managers uh, will talk about. You can have two to three, you can't have three to three. Um, Agile tries to, tries to make that a little bit by making trade-offs about functionality, um, and it's not the focus of, of Agile, it's providing business value. So um, this gave us the ability to do what we need to do to get NDS where it needs to go. We also have a very aggressive schedule, which is another reason why we went to Agile. This is the full safe. This is what, uh, how the safe construct works to manage across multiple teams. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it. Um, it looks more complex than it is because really if you go up, go up from the bottom, it's basically replicating what's at the bottom but at a higher level and with more input from uh, the higher stakeholders as you go up and more uh, oversight by the uh, management team inside the PEL, PMO. Um, so the, the basis is Scrum at, at the bottom where we, we're, we're doing it. We make sure the Scrum teams uh, have users and subject matter experts in place so we can get uh, what I consider real end user um, input to requirements versus getting supervisors and or higher levels deciding how something's done versus how it's really done in the field or in the workplace. Um, so uh, we have uh, program increments uh, every quarter. We decide what the next increment is going to be and how we're going to build it out. Uh, we meet with our stakeholders and our requirements. Uh, just so you know, right now we've been focused primarily on the IM capability uh, and also the um, and what I call NBIS agency, which uh, is the uh, replacement for the agency portion that's used to initiate clearances uh, inside, uh, inside the investigation process. So that's the people we've been talking to to get, to get those requirements. Uh, the other thing we did with uh, this, this is big change for DISA. We're going to what we call a DevOps, or in our case, DevSecOps. It's the integration of the development security and operation environment so we can deploy to uh, releases to directly into the system and it moves to an automated process, what we call a pipeline, to produce the, uh, the software code that we need and we can pull it and get immediate feedback from the end user. Um, we have the setup uh, in an environment, uh, we're moving forward into going into the cloud environment with it uh, and that, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But this is important for us to be able to meet our schedule and to meet uh, the requirement changes that we get. Uh, based on changing priorities from, from our, 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 our stakeholders and functional owners. Um, this is the, the roadmap we're going on. We're going into the cloud environment. Uh, we're, we are hoping to get into the environment in March of next year, which will give us the depth step off, off this environment that we need to operate. Um, one of the big changes that we have is that choice to move into the cloud earlier versus later, uh, and uh, I'll talk more about that at, in, in the, this slide. This slide, just so everybody knows, this slide is still under uh, discussion. This is not set in stone. It's likely going to change based on requirements, changing priorities. But, um, it, but this is what we, we believe is the best way to go forward for NBIS. Um, as I said, we have a release in March for the cloud and, and a, a couple other functionalities. And the major release would be in June based on this uh, for Tier 1. That, like I said, this slide may or may not hold depending on what kind of requirements we get and what kind of priorities change, particularly as we move forward with uh, any ECs coming out, just the work no initiatives and or how the EO is signed and when. Uh, it all affects, affects the release schedule. Um, so uh, that's basically what I have for NBIF. Any questions? Any questions for Sheldon on the uh, web? I don't have any questions in the chat. Okay. Any questions for Sheldon on the uh, phone? If anyone on the phone would like to ask a question, please press pound two. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> I like it. Hi, this is uh, Tricia Stokes again. Um, one thing, can you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Thank, thank you. Um, just one um, kind of clarification from what Sheldon just said on the June Tier 1 um, delivery. Uh, we are working diligently to that desired goal, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do with the business office, with the uh, all the components of, of being able to deploy this. So I just want to go on record and say the roadmap and the true capability and delivery schedule is under development. Thank you. Understood. Sheldon, many thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're next going to hear from Valerie Heil, Associate Director, Industrial Security, OUSDI, Department of Defense. We'll get an update as the NIST uh, Executive Agent. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, several items uh, to update you on. Um, Department of Defense is establishing a Personnel Vetting Transformation Office. The acronym for it, as we do in DOD, is acronyms, PVTO. Um, the PVTO will support planning and enable execution both for transferring background investigations to Defense Security Service and reforming the personnel vetting enterprise. The PVTO will assist in coordinating and aligning resources between the transfer and ongoing security clearance reform efforts or vetting efforts. The, the PVTO's planning support will leverage merger and acquisition best practices and data analysis. Second item, the FY 19 National Defense Authorization Act included a section A42 uh, citing that by October 2020, the Secretary of Defense would no longer require, would have to require national interest determinations for access to prescribed information, which is top secret, SCI, SAP, ComSec, and restricted data for U.S. cleared companies operating under special security agreements where the ownership came from what are referred to as national technology and industrial base companies. When you look then at the uh, supporting legislation about what is in a national, an NTIB company, those would be companies owned in the U.S., Canada, Australia, U.S. companies from owned by Canada, Australia, or the U.K. So, Right now, the Department of Defense is evaluating the legislation and how we would implement it in DOD policy in consultation with ISOO and the other four NIST cognizant security agencies. The third item, the NIST POM reissuance, and as some of you know, we worked informally with the NIST PAC for several years on that. The draft reissuance is currently in DOD coordination. Uh, once we complete the DOD coordination, then we must receive concurrence from the other four NIST cognizant security agencies to the, the version. We will then, and have, it's been confirmed to us recently, that it will then have to go through the federal rulemaking process and become a federal rule. Um, so in that context, general estimate would be that we are probably at least a year or two, wait, at least two years away from publication because at this point in time, Department of Defense does not publish, would not publish the NISPOM unless the companion federal rule was also approved at the same time. And the last item I have is we have talked about a NISPOM change three to incorporate the reporting requirements of the Security Executive Agent Directive number three. We did provide uh, some months ago a draft industrial security letter to the NISPAC for comment. We appreciate those comments that were received. We are still evaluating how to proceed with uh, the industrial security letter for the DOD contractors and those non-DOD agencies for which we have industrial security agreements. The issue that we are grappling with is how to handle the foreign travel reporting. We will keep you in the loop. It's, it's still something we want to do. We just have some challenges in working through the details. And with that, are there any questions? Dennis Keith in this pack. Uh, Valerie, during the stakeholders meeting with DSS yesterday, uh, there was some discussion about the newly established department um, critical technology protection task force. Yes. I'd like to ask if there's a way to clarify what industry's engagement uh, with that task force might be. 
Yes, there is a critical technology protection task force that's been established at DOD under the direction of the Deputy Secretary. I, I, I know that question came up yesterday about industry involvement. I will have to take it back. I'm not sure. I know it's, it's just relatively new as far as being stood up and how that will work. I will take it back and provide some feedback to the back about, about what the task force considers about how it will interact. I, I think I understood yesterday that there was some indication that there might be some periodic roundtables, but I don't really know if that's going to be the case. Okay, thank you. And the second question is uh, also from yesterday with regards to um, uh, new deforest requirements that might be uh, under consideration for the Deliver Uncompromised Initiative. Uh, if there's a way, you know, to uh, advise industry as to the path for consultation on what those deforest requirements might look like. I will take that back to our um, acquisition colleagues um, who handle the, the DAR process for, for deforest clauses. I'm not sure where things might stand with any process for that at this time. Bob Harney, NISPAC. Um, Valerie, on the, back to the task force. Um, has there been any movement as the task force is uh, being stood up or whatever uh, as far as how to kind of rein in some of the variations to the theme that are coming out of, you know, the Navy or the Air Force or whatever on kind of DFARS plus X and things of that nature? as, you know, there's kind of a, a lot of reaction on how to handle, you know, the cyber threats and the, you know, those kinds of activities. Or is that part of the task force mission is to kind of get that kind of, a, so there's something consistent across DOD and then what is being you know, pushed out into industry as new requirements? I would have to say that the task force is still relatively new. So some of what you're asking, I don't have exact details other than the the initial tasker memo that, that, that was sent out across the department and they are uh, filling the billets as far as the task force members. I can take that back also to one of my colleagues who's been uh, detailed. Do have any other detail at this point? Anyone else have any questions for Valerie? Anyone on the uh, WebEx? Anyone have questions for Valerie on the telephone? Okay, thank you so much. Quentin? Spokes? Industry spokes, new industry spokes. <laughs> how about it? Good morning. Um, we have two new industry uh, NISPAC members, Rosie Guerrero and Cheryl Stone. We want to welcome them. Um, we have one change on the MOU. Um, Kai Hansen is now the chair. Um, you can do it. Um, with the vast amount of changes in security policy and procedures, uh, the implementation of these changes is enhanced when industry expertise is leveraged collaboratively early in the process. Um, industry is interested in learning more on the delivery on compromise, on compromise initiative and the possible impacts for industry. Um, we want to thank the ISU for facil facilitating dialogue with uh, Director Avenina to discuss information sharing and collaboration on SEC EA policy issues. Um, when it comes to DSS and transition, um, we're still working with, with uh, collaboratively with the working groups, um, but we we are uh, we do feel that if contingent upon uh, an enhanced understanding of the threat and vulnerability, which is not supported by the current information sharing infrastructure. We're concerned about variances in impl implementation from one field office to the next, and we're still unclear as to the cooperation with the GSAs and concerned about the impacts of uh, introducing, vul introducing vulnerability information to the GCA outside the scope of the contract. Next. We're interested in how CUI governance will be distinct distinguished from uh, Okay, sure. 
Um, under uh, DSS and CUI, we're interested in how CUI governance will be distinguished from NIST governance. Industry continues to be asked doing assessments to describe DFARS compliance with CDI on unclassified net networks. Um, under new business for uh, NDAA, as DOD investigations transition from NB, IB to DSS, we're looking forward to learning more about Trusted Workforce 2.0 as industry engages in the Trusted Workforce Working Groups. When it comes to small businesses, with all the changes industry is concerned about small businesses and the impact on supply chain, we're still waiting for comments from DSS on the NCMS Security Consultant White Paper uh, concerning use of security uh, services providers. Next slide. There's a lot of new systems out there. Seems like they all hit us at the same time. And the uh, industry is concerned with the ability to obtain access to these systems in a timely manner. Uh, it seems that, you know, with certain systems, we're applying and it's taking weeks to get access to these systems. We're still concerned when it comes to lax training for this. Next slide. Industry is still waiting implementation information regarding travel reporting under C3. That was already talked about earlier. Um, we're aware C7 and 8 drafts are under coordination and for, have requested the ability to provide input, but we're still waiting for a response. Next slide. Industry is awaiting more clarification on the formation of the Advisory Committee on Industrial Security and Industrial Based Policy. Um, we are also waiting. Waiting for the slide. <laughs> Maybe waiting a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the last slide is on the, is on the legislation watch, and, and it's just industry is awaiting more clarification on formation of the Advisory Committee on Industrial Security and Industrial Based Policy. We're also waiting for uh, further information on the Defense Policy Advisory Committee on Technology as well. Questions? Just an observation from the Chair. It seems to me you're still waiting on a lot of things. Yes. We and are. I've been Chair now, gosh, for almost two years, and I've been I'm hearing some of the same things over and over again. What we do, in your estimation, to actually do something about this instead of having these quarterly meetings where I keep hearing the same thing. Do we need more working groups? Do we, do we need more meetings like we have with Bill Evanina up on our skiff? We, we, we need more engagement where, where when we're talking with the government and we're speaking with the government. We need them, to, once we leave the meetings, we need them to come back with this. The answers? With the answers. You know, we, we, we have the meetings and tell them what we need or what we want or where we or we're trying to collaborate with them to help them help us but we give them the information, but we don't get anything back in return. Greg, maybe what we ought to do is start holding some meetings ourselves and maybe, you know, just, just pick a topic and, and try to have a meeting about it. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, but I am getting tired of hearing the same, same stuff. I, I mean, I, I, I agree and I appreciate, as uh, Quentin alluded to, there is a lot of different things going on in terms of a lot of systems and what have you. Um, at the same time, it is troubling that things are, I'm not sure what the right word is, percolating but not resolved. Uh, so, um, yeah, that I'm open to other ideas, uh, but that seems reasonable. I mean, this is a partnership, so I'm not, I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus, but, um, I, you know, I've said this so many times, uh, and I think most people agree, there's so much expertise uh, on both sides, industry and government, and uh, that's that's where the, the real value, I think, lies in, in a committee like this, is not just hearing about that expertise, but then putting it to good use, putting it into practice. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I think so, if that, that's the direction we need to take. I think that's right. I mean, we actually need to do something. Uh, again, I'm getting a little... Again, I understand too. I mean, you all, particularly uh, DOD, is taking on an 
challenging task here with this background investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a time of, of enormous transition and uncertainty. That said, I mean, if this committee can't resolve things, then I wonder what the point of it is. So I think that we, we need to do a better job actually getting some, some answers. And again, it may be answers you don't like, but at least to get you an answer. I mean something. Hey, exactly. So let's let's see what we can we can do a better job on that. I, I would say on behalf of the executive agency, Mrs. Valerie Howe, that DOD does because there have been a number of speakers today uh, from DOD and itself, and there will be some additional speakers. We do to the utmost of our ability, and the information and the processes that are ongoing provide as as up to date information as we can. All, we, all I can say again is we're a team and we need to work, work uh, together because obviously, which, why are we here? It's the security of the United States. So, I mean, that's, that's, we're on the same side. So, we just need to do a, a better job, I think, about uh, at least voicing what you need and then hearing uh, what we legitimate, legitimate concerns on, on, on both sides. So, so, I would suggest we'll reach out yeah. and kind of call it a, a program resolution meeting because that's – we're, we're at the point where we've got a lot of things that are on the table and I think we need at least more clarity definition as to, you know, if we can't, like you said, some things, uh, Mr. Chair, we can't resolve in a way that industry may find favorable, but uh, they deserve a, a response. I know there's some things out there about this. For example, I mentioned in the beginning the, the use of the consultants and uh, for uh, the small businesses. So. Uh, We'll frame it as a, as a resolution type meeting uh, and see where we can go with that, if you agree. I think that would, would, would be a healthy thing to do. Okay. You know, as long as it's done collaboratively and obviously collegially. Right. Okay. Uh, anyone have any questions for uh, Quentin? Anyone on the uh, WebEx? No questions in the chat. Right. Anybody on the uh, phone for Quentin? And once again on the phones, please press pound two on your telephone keypad if you wish to ask a question. Okay, no one on the phone for Quentin. Quentin, thank you. We're going to hear from Keith a minute from the DSS who gives an update on their initiatives, and then we'll take our uh, ten-minute break. Welcome, Keith. I guess I'm holding for breaks so. though. Uh, Mr. Chair, in part of the discussion previously there, I think what we have to do is, is prioritize, prioritize actions and look at accurate expectations on timelines to accomplish certain things. Some things do take a little bit longer with 12,200 cleared facilities and 900,000 cleared employees as we work these processes. Uh, that being said, um, first welcome uh, Quentin as a new industry chair and also the new members of NISPAC. So uh, first is we'll talk about NISP contract classification system. It's been a slow roll, but we're moving forward now. In a, hopefully decent pace, and that's thanks to our service partners out there, Army, Air Force, and Navy. We're really looking to get some implementation in place. It is a flow-down system, so as we talk to industry, keep in mind that uh, this all starts with the prime contract 254, so bear with us as we move through the process, and uh, we want to make sure that we got the effective capability in place to ensure that the optimal use of the system is, is there for industry. Speaking of industry, one thing I'd like to note for the smaller companies out there, that unless you're, unless you're subbing contracts in NCCS uh, down to a sub as a prime, the system itself will generate a 254 from your prime and send it to you by email. So not all of industry will actually have to have NCCS as we deploy out. Quint, in regards to uh, help desk and information, uh, we do have the DLA help desk that does support contract uh, account management and uh, CAM services for your contract account managers. Uh, either you can go there directly from information on our website or you can actually, through the DSS Knowledge Center, be referred there. We do have an email address on our website to help address operational issues outside of what DLA provides. What we really need to know, Quentin, is, is what's the services that we don't have right now available, and what's the issues that we need to address in the future through a help desk or knowledge center to make sure we're providing the right services to, to cleared industry uh, partners and also government industry. Second is is uh, advisory committee that was up. We're actually in the process of uh, working nominees for both government and industry, primary and alternate. It's a it's a little bit of a process that we have to go through for approvals and nominations. So bear with us. We're tentatively scheduled to have a again I'll say tentatively scheduled to have a first advisory committee meeting in late uh, second quarter. Uh, actually today Chris Forrest is actually the designated federal official for uh, the committee. He's here he's here president of the NISPAC. 
So as we go along, we'll keep industry informed in that process. Um, one thing I would like to note is actually over the last uh, couple of packs, we've been working uh, with our operations side of the house and also field personnel on the issues addressed in the NCMS white paper. It took us a while to find out what from the field's perspective, what our issues were from our side to make sure we can have a collaborative effort with industry to move along. I understand that our operations side of the house is planning an early December meeting with Michelle Sutton and about 12 industry partners to further address those issues for uh, small businesses, security consultants, and security services. Just as a note, um, you may have seen it in public comment, the SF-328 certificate pertaining to foreign interest was out for comment. The fundamental changes of the document, just uh, 10 questions didn't change. The form was updated to provide uh, its use for the Defense Enhanced Security Program as well as DHS as a cognitive security agency for their critical, classified critical infrastructure protection program. So again, just no questions, no change to the questions, just for its use. So uh, you heard uh, Greg mention earlier about CUI. I'll just give a quick update. We're in the final stages of the recommendations and plan and plan of action that will go to the USDI based on the, the May 2018 memo. Uh, we're working with our government partners right now. And as we move along, and we actually once, once we get a head nod and approval on the recommendations, we'll begin the process of engaging industry. What I want to make a point of for industry is, is that this, but then this is about 10% of the entire defense industrial base for which this uh, puts DSS as a functional manager for and lead. So keep in mind when we start reaching out for CUI and industry as partners, it, the NIST will be a component of that, but we have much have a 90, another 90% that we have to manage into the integration process to make sure that we're engaging the entire community. Um, we see that over the next probably uh, 30 to 60 days, it will have an opportunity to start looking for the right industry partners as we work through this process. Uh, we have had very good success working with our service partners and uh, acquisitions and the DOD CIO in this process, and we look forward to uh, engaging over the next uh, period of time as we implement these processes in DOD. And the last I have for you before your break is Reminder, USA Learning is a transition from STEP. It's out there. CDSE posts new training all the time. Take a look at the CDSE website to see what's available for training. Subject to your questions. Okay. Lights are bright. Show anybody on the web. Anyone on the phone for uh, Keith? No questions on the phone. Thank you so much. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. Okay. Restrooms are out here to the left. If you please be back uh, in 10 minutes. That'll be 11.45. Yeah, okay. 11.45, we can uh, wrap it up. <clears throat> okay, our next speaker will be Patricia Stokes from DF DVS, who update us on the transfer of investigations to DSS. Thank you. Um, yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah. 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 Patricia? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I am the director of the Defense Vetting Directorate uh, of the Defense Security Service. Uh, I updated your forum last time, and as Charlie su suggested, I went back and looked at the notes, and, and um, so I'm here to bring you up to speed on where we've been since then. Um, as Mr. Phelan um, indicated, we are all anxiously awaiting um, the, in, in, uh, the incoming executive order, which we expect to be imminent, um, and, uh, but that has not deterred us in any fashion on moving forward with our planning with our NBIB partners. We are engaged daily on many facets of the transfer, and I think you could probably imagine there are a myriad of them. And, um, but I can tell you that the uh, Defense Security Service Defense Vetting Director team is really focused on the transformation aspects of, of, the, um, of the transition and uh, the other uh, heavy lifting of the acquisitions and the people, the HR components and the facilities and all of that um, the sundry of, of important things are being handled uh, by our headquarters uh, with a, a joint team with MBIB um, and certainly with support of the Personnel Vetting Transformation Office that um, Ms. Heil briefed you on earlier. 
Um, the other thing that the Defense Vetting Directorate is doing is um, uh, in, all, in all the transfer activities, uh, this includes, and I don't want to leave this out, the transfer of the Department of Defense Consolidated Adjudication Facility, small portions of the uh, Defense Manpower Data Center, a uh, few, few of their people, and certainly all of the systems that support the vetting enterprise. And then finally, the Defense Information Systems Agency Program Executive Office for the National Background Investigation System. All of those entities will be transferring to the Defense Security Service, soon to be renamed the Defense Security Counterintelligence Agency, or Defense Counterintelligence, Counterintelligence Security Agency. Let me make sure I get the acronym right. Um, so progress since uh, the last meeting is um, we are also, we're working very, very closely in the DVD directorate with our National Background Investigation System partners and, um, and also the Personnel Vetting Transformation Office, again, that Valerie mentioned. We're very, very much aligned in supporting and participating in the Trusted Workforce 2.0 because that is defining our future. Uh, we sit on the Executive Steering Group Committee that meets monthly that will culminate at the end of this year uh, with um, the, a presidential, a draft presidential directive and many other uh, artifacts, re uh, revisions to federal investigative standards, revision to the adjudicative guidelines, and a myriad of other reforms. The heavy lifting on all of this work has been completed by uh, the PAC PMO, the Performance Accountability Council Program Management Office, they have done an extraordinary job. I believe maybe the DNI may address some of this when they have the podium next. Um, but everything that they are doing, we expect to be documented uh, and we'll get some actually relief early next year in another executive correspondence. As we all know, in this town it takes a while for presidential directives and, and executive orders and policy to be amended, but that is not stopping the leadership uh, of the PAC in, in reforming efforts and giving us some immediate authority early next year through another executive correspondence, much like the three that they previously issued, to get started on some of these reform changes. So the Department of Defense DVD is um, ready and we're poised to start executing those changes in the um, executive correspondence that is anticipated um, again early next year. And um, what we have done since I, spoke in, since I spoke with you last is we've established something that I mentioned earlier when I cut in on the phone call. On, uh, we've established our Enterprise Business Support Office. Now, what, what that is, to, for simplification for the group, is, is really the support office, the customer support office, and the system development on the business side support office that will sit side by side in the Agile acquisition framework that Sheldon described in his briefing with our developmental operational counterparts. So it's really the subject matter experts that I bring to the table that sit with the DevOps to actually build capability, provide the requirements, build the capability, as the developers build the capability, test out the capability. At the same time, we have, will have business units that are attached to that that address the, the other parts of the things of, of deploying a, a enterprise capabilities such as, such as this. And that will be a strategic communications team that will be able to communicate with our customers early, before these deployments, what's coming, what to expect, building the training that's necessary to understand how to execute when the capabilities are deployed in small increments, uh, addressing the policy issues with the policy makers, whether it be the SECEA, the CDA, or our, um, our own policy makers within uh, the Department of Defense as we assume this mission, um, and making sure the policies are aligning to allow us to execute these new capabilities and these new deployments, and then uh, certainly a performance and metrics shop that will be measuring our every um, action to make sure that we are making progress in the right direction, that we are, we are executing data-driven decisions, um, and that we stay in a continuous improvement mode. Um, 
Secondly, um, we've been working on uh, very diligently on the execution of the last executive correspondence, which has provided us significant um, activity and I would say um, relief. And what that did is it allowed us to defer our clean periodic reinvestigations and put them directly into the um, continuous evaluation program. To date, we have deferred over 35,000 cases. We started this on July 31st. This is a very good news story. Why? Because we are not adding to uh, Mr. Phelan's backlog or inventory, and we are also, it's also allowing us to really kick the tires and test, test reform in, in, in realistic ways. Um, and uh, so we continue to refine those business rules. We learn every week. Our stats keep growing. Uh, we are working with the executive agent, the security executive agent, to further refine our business rules so we can increase our uh, deferment thresholds and our, our rate of cases that we're putting in deferment by sending into the inventory. And I would like to remind everybody in the room right now, because this question always comes up and invariably I'll get asked, um, is that the executive correspondence that was issued that allowed us to do this uh, says that these cases will be reciprocally accepted by all agencies. Um, I understand that the system of record doesn't reflect that, and that's a challenge, but we were not going to hold up this, this very, very important authorization and ability to not add to inventory and start testing our transformation and reform, waiting on a system change. Um, Perhaps uh, Ms. Langley could give us, as a group, some more further fidelity as to when that system change will uh, be realized and it will be reflected in the system of record. Um, but in the meantime, and I know industry is struggling greatly with this because they support multiple customers, uh, I, can, I can tell you that the best, uh, your best course of action would be to uh, touch base with your government sponsor when you get pushed back or call the Vetting Risk Operations Center Industry Division, probably previously known to most of you as the Office for Industry, and bring the issue up to them so we can provide some assistance. That's my update. Any questions? Any questions? Please. Yeah, we need a microphone for... I just have a quick question. This is and Kim Bottle from the State Department. Identify yourself, yeah, please. I did. You were. I heard you, Kim. Thank you. I just want to make sure, from a from a user agency standpoint, I don't really know who to call anymore at Defense Security Service. To be honest with you on issues. So, are you right. saying that you kind of are the whole kit and caboodle? Like we're supposed to call you for everything? You have the subject matter experts. You have the policies. You have all this stuff. So for the background, or whatever that we're supposed to contact with questions or concerns? For the background investigation mission, if that's what your question is, yes, I am the kit and caboodle for the background investigation mission. And um, what, what we are going to do, and uh, this, this call and, and your questions, ma'am, have um, also uh, enlightened me to, A, we need to put a presence on the website, and we also probably need to actually quickly establish a um, enterprise business office support office uh, box where we can actually entertain your questions and then get back to you. But um, I, I would not take uh, responsibility for the critical technology program or the counterintelligence program. But anything from the background investigation and vetting mission, yes, I am. I am your single point of entry. Answer your question. So, so then, policy stuff is still keeps, and I just I guess I'd like an org chart of DSS right now. Well, the org chart for DSS is under development, and it is with our director. And once our director gets it approved through the Department of Defense, I'm sure it will be shared. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question? Um, yes. Hi, Trish. This is Mike Scott from DHS. Uh, hey, Mike. A real quick question on the. We understand that the systems are going to take a little while to build out the JPAS, whether somebody's in CE, that you're that not going to do that. We're going to go into okay. this so we can, can do the reciprocity or the. Um, in the previous meeting, there was talked about there's going to be interim guidance on exactly where to call to find out that information. Do we have a timeline when that guidance is going to come out for us as an agency so we can use that to help our partners and, and ourselves for people transition? 
Uh, well, Mike, uh, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna take that for action. All right. Um, I I think, and I don't want to speak. I think I, I have members from the BROC there who might be able to address what is on the website for for them um, right now. But we we certainly need to get the, the message out. So, do I have a BROC member in the audience who might be able to address what's on the site for for industry? And I know that I know your Homeland Security, Mike. So. Um, we certainly need to um, address that on our web, uh, BSS website for the DVD as well. Yeah, this is Patrick Hogan with uh, VROC. Uh, so we do have information on our website. We posted a uh, kind of frequently asked questions related to the deferment. And on there, there's an email address for those kind of questions about enrollment in C, especially for the government customers looking to have uh, verification while we wait for that technical solution to catch up. Any other questions? Carolyn, any web action? No questions in the chat. Okay, any questions on the uh, telephone? No questions on the phone. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be good. Keep in mind the Defense Security Service. Uh, Kim, you're right. So over the next uh, probably period of time, you're going to see, you know, we're going from a a few mission space to a large, a multi-mission agency. So there will be a, a wide range of changes that go along. Um, and I'm sure as we go along, those changes will be formalized and socialized. But when you think about um, just a few years ago, you think about the CDSE mission, the, the NIST mission, and some counterintelligence services uh, post the, the previous background investigation mission. Now with a, a wide range of CUI, CTP, NIST, background investigation, as we grow, we will have to evolve and get the right organization structure out to everybody to make sure it's understanding that we no longer have what used to be single points of contact in to potentially because of the multi-mission space, a wide range of points of contact. Okay, anyone else? All right. Thank you so much. Our next speaker will be Valerie Kerbin, ODNI. Uh, she'll provide a Security Executive Agent Directive seed policy update. Valerie on the phone? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, on behalf of the security executive agent, I'm pleased to announce that Seed 7, Reciprocity of Background Investigation, the National Security Adjudication, has been signed by the DNI as of November 9th. So at this point, it's being prepared for distribution to executive departments and agencies. And of course, our websites will be updated shortly thereafter. There will also be um, a push to our security executive agent advisory committee members. So it will be forthcoming to you all um, for your information and for um, implementation within your agencies. Okay, and for an update on security executive agent directive eight, the temporary eligibility. It is still in draft, and we have received our um, comments back from all of the agencies, and it's finishing up in the adjudication process. We received many comments, which we are considering a lot of those in the revisions, and we are hopefully going to have it submitted to OMB for formal interagency review by the end of the year. That is our goal. And I know Charlie and Tricia um, spoke a little bit on Trusted Workforce 2.0, but for those of you unfamiliar with it, this effort will lead to an overhaul of the security clearance process and the security and the executive steering group does include ODNI, OPM, OMB, DOD, MBIB, DHS, FBI, the IC, and industry partners. They are all engaged and meeting frequently. Um, the first step on everybody's agenda was, of course, to take those substantial steps to address the backlog investigation. And um, phase two, which is what we're working on now, is to revamp the fundamental approach and supporting policy framework to ensure it's aligned. And we're overhauling the business process, plans to improve timeliness, quality, and effectiveness of the process to help further reduce the inventory. 
and we're modernizing or plans to modernize the information technology architecture to expedite the migration of continuous vetting model. So these are the things that are work, being worked on from the executive steering group and also the PAC, which has the lead on ensuring all of these decisions are brought forward to the executive steering group. And that is all I have to provide. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Valerie? Yes. Uh, um, go ahead, Greg. Greg Pannoni, ISU. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Um, a lot of good progress. Appreciate that. And as you may know, uh, many of us were at the AIA NDIA conference in San Antonio last month, and we had the opportunity, Bill Evanina, for all the industry folks to meet with, uh, and I was too. So we had, we had good discussion, I would characterize it as far as the back and forth flow of the exchange of information. But one of the items you mentioned on the Trusted Workforce 2.0 and that there are industry members on that group, and I understand there are two, I believe it's Doug Thomas and Hillebrand, is it, the other fellow? But evidently from what I've heard from my industry colleagues is that they're not allowed to share information that they are learning about and participating in the working group. So I'd ask that you take that back to Mr. Evanina to see if there's something we can do here uh, to large the aperture just a little bit. You know, we're only talking about the eight NISPAC industry members uh, as far as being able to share and utilize their expertise to uh, have more input from industry on that, on that group. Mm -hmm. Um, I will take that back. I just also want to caution you that a lot of the information is pre-deliberative and they're making decisions, so some information is not even being shared um, outside of this group at this point, but there will be the opportunities for some stakeholder input, so I'll let the PAC know and also uh, Mr. Evanina that you're addressing that concern. Yeah, Bob Harney, NISPAC. Um, Valerie, on the kind of in the same vein as uh, Greg's question, but uh, with the seed uh, that is about to be published, um, since industry had no view into that at all or ability to input, is there any language in there uh, you know, regarding CE and reciprocity? And for seed eight, now that it's in kind of its you know infant stages, is there any chance, as, as Bill had uh, had alluded to to having the NISPAC be able to have some level of review and comment on that as progressing through the, the uh, approval process. Mm -hmm. um, Barb, okay, Bob, in regard to seed seven, it does talk about um, different ways of accepting reciprocity and you all be seeing that. I don't want to get into all the specifics. Um, but for seed eight, we're just at the process now. It's going to be ready for OMB. And as far as I know, OMB um, only goes out to agencies for formal comments. So um, we're still looking at ways to possibly share it with you through the process. But at this point, um, we're still moving ahead to get it to OMB. Still in draft. Any other questions for Valerie? Lena, WebEx? No questions. Okay. Anyone have questions for Valerie on the telephone? A reminder to those on the phone, if you wish to ask a verbal question at any time, please press pound two on your phone. No questions on the phone at this time. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Well, next year from uh, Mark Riddle of my office on the uh, implementation of the Controlled and Classified Information uh, Program. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, this is going to be a pretty short update. I know we're usually pretty long-winded on the CUI side of things, so this will be refreshing. Right? So uh, generally, right now, uh, of course, we're in the middle of agency implementation and agency reporting on their efforts to implement the program. Um, majority of the agencies in the executive branch have reported to us 
on their status, and already a number of agencies are asserting full compliance with the CY program. This means that they have policy training, that they've transitioned their physical environment and also information systems to the standards of the program, which is great. Um, now is going to start the, the work of validation, or, or what we love to hear of inspection. Uh, so ISU oversights in our role um, in, in regard to the CY program, so we are going to be going out and evaluating and assessing every agency that asserts, you know, full completion of um, all of our milestones related to participation. Also, if any agency out there has a complete policy training module, you're going to see ISU stepping out into the executive branch and uh, validating and, and making whatever course corrections are necessary to ensure that there is alignment with the program standards. Of course, the results of the annual report submissions from agencies will be detailed in our annual report to the President. Um, generally, based on what I'm seeing compared to fiscal year 17, we have seen a lot of movement, um, largely because money has been flowing. Uh, agencies sources in the way of um, implementation of the CY program, so as a result, we've seen a lot of movement among a lot of agencies. They've also been at it two years, so they got some momentum. But what you can expect and what we're predicting is that once agencies issue that agency-level implementing policy, everything seems to follow pretty aggressively. Um, uh, system transition, physical environments. Uh, more to come on that, of course. Uh, now, the CUI registry is what we protect in the CUI program. If you um, haven't been there yet, I, I highly recommend that you do a visit to the CUI registry page. It lists all the categories of CUI along with guidance documents that we issue to help agencies and other stakeholders, industry, uh, state, local, tribal, academic institutions who have to, are subject to the requirements of the program, uh, guidance to help them understand and implement the program as best they can. Also, what you'll notice, um, it's been a while since we've been out here, is that ISU has developed a number of training modules to assist agencies and stakeholders uh, train the workforce on the standards of the program. These training videos are, are posted on our page, also hosted off of YouTube. Um, they're free for all to use. A number of um, cabinet level agencies and also are using these to satisfy the training requirements of the program. We highly recommend that um, you know you Take a look. Uh, you don't have to use them, but they will save you on the development of these training modules. We address everything from to document marketing, um, and then of course the concepts of lawful government purpose, and of course our, our relationship to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, in regard to notices, um, one of the things that you'll notice about the CY program is that we issue a lot of CY notices, clarifying guidance or policy points on how this program is structured or um, how it should be implemented. Um, over the next, I would say, 30 days, you're going to see a number of new notices hit the streets that are going to assist agencies in the program. Um, everything from document destruction to provisional categories to even the process mission control markings. Uh, moving quickly to my third bullet here about the federal acquisition regulation. Um, what this is going to do for the government once it officially takes hold is it's going to standardize the way that executive branch agencies convey safeguarding guidance to non-federal entities. Right now there is some inconsistencies, of course, as you know, um, whenever an agency enters into an agreement with a non-federal entity, they're, they're oftentimes referencing their policies and procedures and their naming conventions associated with sensitive information. Once the FAR hits the streets, and by our estimation right now, should be sometime in uh, the summer of that message will be consistent. Um, everybody in the room is familiar with the DD-254, which is, you know, that form that agencies use right now to convey the safeguarding requirements related for classified information. The CUI FAR will have a similar type of form accompanying it, where agencies, when they issue a contract that for CUIs involved, they will be required to complete this form where the categories of information, the safeguarding standards, dissemination controls will all be conveyed. One of the, the goals that you'll see, one of our goals, of course, is to make things better. And we believe that the federal acquisition regulation will make that um, process and, and bring a lot of clarity to how agencies convey that safeguarding guide. 
One of the things you can expect, of course, is that the public will get an opportunity and industry will get an opportunity to comment on the federal acquisition regulation. Right now, we project that the FAR will be out for public comment sometime near the end of January of 2019. If you subscribe to the CUI blog, you'll get an update about when that regulation is out there for um, public consumption. I encourage everybody to take a peek at it. Uh, and provide some comments to make it better. Uh, like with every regulatory process, the more hands that we have in that, um, in that process, the better the product will be. And since it's going to affect you, uh, sure, uh, we highly recommend you take a look and, and provide those comments. Uh, my fourth bullet here speaks to our regular update that we perform to stakeholders. Uh, every quarter, of course, um, the CY program has a webinar for all stakeholders of the CY program. This is eight state, local, tribal, everybody tunes in um, and asks questions uh, in regard to the program. It's also a way for us just to convey the general status of things like the federal acquisition regulation, new training modules that we've developed, awareness products, but it's also just a great forum for Q&A or even just for us to solicit suggestions from uh, the stakeholders of the CUI program. Initiatives that we have underway uh, in the CUI program that eventually manifest themselves notice come from these stakeholder discussions. So if you haven't participated and tuned into those, highly recommend you do. Also, as the executive agent for the program, we have a very open door as far as um, communication goes. Uh, literally anybody can contact us through our inbox or our ask a question, offer a suggestion. I, I guarantee you every one of those will be reviewed and you will get a response. Due to the volume, it does take us some time to, to get back to everybody, but somebody will get back to you and incorporate those things. Now, we had one yesterday, uh, our stakeholder briefing. The next one will be February 13th, uh, 1 to 3. Of course, the deep that will be available on our CY blog. Uh, also, uh, lastly, to close out, um, on December 10th, we're planning a CY Industry Day, and that is exactly sounds like where um, we're at, we're two years into implementation, a number of um, industry folks and agencies want a, a forum where they can get out there and, and talk about the products and services that they've developed to assist agencies and other stakeholders as they implement the program. It's a free event. Um, the schedule of all the vendors and also the presenters are posted to the CUI blog. We encourage you to kind of spread the word if you want to uh, attend, of course, just shoot a, a quick email to CI at narrow.gov. Let us know that you're planning to come and that you're planning to bring 50 of your closest friends with you. Um, it, it should be a great event. If we, if we have a good turnout, which it already looks like we're going to, we'll probably do this again um, for summer. Um, so keep that in mind. Everything that we do in regard to Industry Day is first come, first serve, uh, meaning that you know, as soon as we drop the notice to our CUI blog that we're having this thing, you know, we get flooded with uh, you know, request to be a presenter or to even have a booth at the event. Our only criteria is that whatever you're presenting or whatever you're going to present or at a booth at this event has something to do with CUI. And, and I think that industry really provided a really great agenda for us. We have folks who are talking about automated marking tools for the electronic environment, of course, uh, destruction requirements. Um, folks are out there who are assisting companies and agencies with compliance to the standards of the CY program for the electronic environment. This means SP 853 for the government folks. Really good stuff. Uh, we're really hopeful. Uh, uh, just a word of caution, and we have to say this, is that, of course, I see we have not evaluated any of these products and services. Um, agencies already are using some of these, and, and they've conducted the evaluation. So we always say, you know, Buy with caution, always do your own evaluation before you start uh, signing out those checks. And I think at this time I'll open it up for questions for everybody on the WebEx, on the call, in the room. Um. I'm going to make a comment. Um, I want to, I, I assume responsibility for CUI end of July, and I, I really want to commend Mark Riddle in particular and the entire CUI team uh, in general. They've done a fantastic job. Probably many of you know it's, it's been an uneven uh, process getting this CUI program implemented. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, we're seeing some good, really good progress, and a lot of that goes to Mark and the team. I um, also want to put this out. I did check with the boss. 
Uh, it just occurred to me we have a CUI advisory council, which is all government right now. Uh, we'll check the charter and bylaws, but I don't believe there's any reason why we couldn't extend at least an observer role to a non-federal entity on that advisory council that meets about monthly. So we're going to we're going to look at that and put that out. You don't have to keep it just to the NIST because it's much bigger than that. So yeah, that's all. So uh, one of the great things, of course, is that we, we chair the CUI Advisory Council, which is comprised of about 26 agencies, cabinet agencies, uh, and also some of the suspects that you would expect to see there. Um, and, and this is something that we'll definitely raise at our, our next council meeting, which is December 13th, and, and possibly open it up for um, industry. Right now, of course, um, you know, uh, some things that we talk about at the CUI Advisory Council that uh, would be appropriate for industry to be there because, of course, we're, you know, we're talking about changing markings and standards and we don't want to get Absolutely, I think that when we meet in probably as early as January, uh, we might open that one up. You know, probably, we always have a pretty open phone line and we have to have your RSVP. But. Keep an eye out for that. Um, if we do open something up at the next council meeting, we'll probably post it to the blog. So again, subscribe. It's really great. Um, are there any other questions, comments? And as a reminder to our virtual audience, if you wish to ask a verbal question, please press pound two on your phone and your line will be unmuted. Or if you prefer to submit a written chat, please use the chat panel and send questions to all panelists to be read out loud. No. Okay. Apparently. Sounds like there are no questions. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Right, we're going to move uh, rapidly into our working group reports. Greg, you're going to start with the insider uh, threatening. Carl Hellman will give us one on the uh, this update. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, try to be quick. Uh, insider threat working group. We did uh, convene a meeting on October 30th. Um, purpose was to evaluate the process the government will use to evaluate the effectiveness of contractor insider threat programs and in general to provide a forum for NISPAC members to discuss ways to improve the program. Uh, the government received, excuse me, the group received two briefings, one on the DOD ITP policy and foundational documents and one from DSS which was an overview on insider threat effectiveness. Uh, the primary principles for the program for effectiveness, program effectiveness conveyed were program management, awareness training, information systems protection, collection and integration, and analysis and response. Each of these principles have associated ITP requirements and corresponding uh, assessment products, uh, assessment, excuse me, factors for determining the effectiveness of their implementation. Other points in evaluating effectiveness discussed included consideration of the whole program as well as the size and complexity, compliance not necessarily determining effectiveness, and an ineffective program may impact the overall security rating. In sum, there are three steps to evaluation of ITP effectiveness, review program requirements, assess program implementation, and determine effectiveness. Uh, the group plans to meet again sometime in mid-January or early, early February. Um, we encourage, uh, in particular, the CSA, the other CSAs. Um, DOD was was terrific. They were well represented, as I say, and these these briefings came from them. Uh, but we would ask that the other CSAs come join us and discuss their approach to uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the insider threat. Are there any questions? None. Anyone on the phone for the insider uh, working group, uh, threat working group? No questions on the phone. Right. Carl, Hellman, please. Step up. All right, give us the latest on the... I do the, uh, have one comment that I just got on here. Um, they're saying they have 10 minutes left on the call, so... Okay. What was it? There's only 10 minutes left on the call. Oh. Okay. Yep. Carl, go ahead. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moving rather quickly. 
Um, just to want to update on what the uh, kind of what the NISA working group is working on and what DSS is working on. Uh, since our last meeting, one of the things that uh, we we were talking about is our transition to EMAS as our system of record for assessment and authorizations of classified systems. Uh, we had initially been looking at a uh, launch date of that, a transition date of that of October 1. We ran into an issue with the access to the training site, which is uh, maintained by DISA. So uh, working with the working group and some other AIA, NDIA, and NCMS, we delayed our transition. Uh, DISA was able to fix the uh, to, to fix the issues with the with access, and so uh, we now have some dates for our, our transition to uh, EMAS as the system of record. Uh, March 18, 2019, will be our transition date. Uh, we will also have a new version of our process manual available in mid February, which will allow people about a month to read it and uh, comment you know, and uh, comprehend it. Uh, just uh, we use the NISA working group as a point of uh, reference for industry to get comments and feedback on the, on the process manual. We had already completed that because we were scheduling to, to do that in October. So uh, probably in uh, late December, early January, we will use the working group to send out what is going to be the final draft for one last comment from industry and uh, some of our government stakeholders. And as always, uh, any, any information we have on the NIST risk management framework process and uh, our EMAS process falls under our dss.mil slash RMS. Uh, one of the proposals that, uh, I don't know if this, we can go down and see, one of the things that we are working on within the working group is a proposal systems initiative. We've had a lot of feedback from industry on the, uh, the ability to get proposal systems authorized and up and running quickly to, to work with the speed of business. So we've asked our industry partners, we've, we've uh, kind of floated out a couple of different um, items or ways that we can look to uh, expedite this. And uh, I think the industry owes us some feedback by the end of this month through the working group. Uh, we've been working with the other CSAs on this also. I know that uh, currently we've been working with uh, the staff CIO on uh, on this effort, we've been working with the CIA. They, uh, their industrial security folks have a very good proposal system template. So we're not going to try to reinvent the wheel. We're going to try to take the best efforts that people have already done and come up with a, a, a more consistent way of having those uh, be submitted throughout from industry, throughout all the, uh, the, the folks that do accreditations so that we can get those done on a little quicker basis. So. Uh, that is uh, one of our, that is our big hot topic from uh, the working group. Um, I, let's see, maybe we'll go, maybe we won't. So my last slide is uh, to talk about the metrics. And th for those of you from industry who were, uh, who were around at the industry stakeholders or DSS yesterday, just a little bit about the uh, DSS metrics. Uh, we, are, we are measuring uh, workload and resources currently for our senior leadership, both in the field and at headquarters. Uh, the idea being that where we, where we, and we're doing it by regions, is to figure out where we have the most workload, where we have the most impact, and direct resources to that. Currently, uh, we, on a rolling 12-month basis, we receive about 450 uh, SST submissions for classified systems. And we're currently producing about 350 authorizations to operate from those systems. About 15 percent of the of the submissions we receive, we return back to industry for corrections of the of the plan, whether it's lacking some sort of detail or some sort of information. And just a little under 10 percent of the overall systems that we receive are either denied by DSS straight away or canceled by industry. So that kind of affects some of. Um, but uh, one of the things, if, I, if, if the slide were to move forward, I will show you. I could have showed you is that we see well, we see bubbles and we see attempts that to leverage uh, bandwidth. Uh, in the northern region, we had a bubble of uh, of workload, and in the capital region of DSS, we had a we had some availability of resources, and we are in the middle of a. Uh, of a 12-week effort of sending folks in the capital region to the northern region to work down that 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 uh, bubble. So uh, we are using using 
our current our current inventory of, of plans and, and that we're reviewing, and we're also uh, looking at what's coming due, what, what things are expiring in the next 90 and 180 days, so we can do some workforce planning. So, we're subject to your questions. Any questions on the phone for Carl? No questions on the phone. Okay, thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome, Carl. Thank you. Sir, I'll go cede my time because it's really a summation of everything that's been talked about already from the seeds to the other things. So uh, in the interest of getting us uh, the stats and whatnot, I'd suggest we move forward. I accept that. All right. Moving to the statistics uh, part now on the uh, personal security clearance performance metrics. All right, we'll start with Olga Delgada, ODNI. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Olga Delgado. Um, I'm just going to provide an overview um, of where we stand with the ICs and DSS's security clearances at this time. So the data in this deck, next slide, um, we're on slide two, really um, identifies security clearance timeliness processing for contractor cases. Um, the data for industry uh, for DOD is provided by OPM, and IC contract data is provided by the following agencies, CIA, DIA, FBI, NGA, NRO, NSA, and the Department of State. And the timeliness data is being provided to really report the length of time that contractor cases take, not contractor performance. We don't account for pre and post casework, and unless otherwise specified in the DAC, initial secret data is a combination of legacy investigative types to align with the FIS, so, um, and also the Tier 3 investigations. Next slide. This slide uh, 3 highlights the timeliness methodology and evolution. So you can see as how this has transformed since 2004. We're currently using the methodology established in 2012, and we're currently in the process of evaluating what elements should or should not be changed and modified, and this is a part of the Trusted Workforce 2.0 effort. Next slide. Slide four um, highlights by quarter the average days of the fastest 90% of reported clearance decisions made for the IC and DSS. So in, compare, in comparing uh, FY18 quarter three, uh, which is the orange bar, and the FY quarter four, which is the purple bar, if you take a look um, across the spectrum, you'll see um, for secret confidential cases, there was a slight increase in, in time. If you take a look at the top secret cases, you'll see a slight decrease. And, um, w between quarters three and four. And then, of course, for PRs, you'll see a slight increase there as well. And I do have a little caveat here on this slide. Um, this data is all-inclusive. However, we've only included a summation up to quarter three. Um, we are still missing a few submissions from agencies to complete quarter four. So that um, gets after that, that item highlighted there. Slide five speaks to secret clearances for the IC and DOD. If you take a look at that as well, between quarters one and quarters four, you'll note several differences. Um, if you take a look at quarter one, it took 31 days to initiate an investigation, and currently in quarter four, it's taking 39 days. So um, to get after this, we are encouraging both industry and executive branch departments and agencies to assist with that process to, include, to ensure timely submission of investigations. And for those that um, have been contacted, we thank you for your support and getting after um, that process and come to find those efficiencies. Um, also, if you take a look at quarter one and quarter three, you'll see a slight reduction in days. Next slide. Slide six. Here we have the highlight, um, which speaks to top secret clearances, SSDIs, and Tier 5. Again, um, if you take a look down uh, for quarters one and four, the initiation dates were doing better for top secret clearances by a few days. 
Um, but on the top end, you'll see a slight reduction of days as well in terms of processing. So we're hopeful that we'll continue to see that decline. Moving on to slide seven, periodic reinvestigation as well as tier five. If you take a look and compare quarters one and four, um, quarter one for initiations, it took 62 days to initiate a PR, and now we're down to 42 days. So again, um, different strides have been taken to reduce these days and to find those efficiencies up front to ensure the complete submission um, of these PRs as well for those that are, are required for work. Um, and of course, the slight increase in days overall. Next slide. If you have any questions, feel free to send us an email at secia at dni.gov. That's all I have. Any questions for Olga? Patrick Hogan, DOD. DSS. I uh, would like to just uh, provide you guys with a um, kind of year in review for FY18. Uh, we don't have the, the numbers up on display, so I'll go ahead and just uh, read those through to you. Uh, due to continued budget challenges, of course, DSS was metering investigations at the end of the year, reaching a high of 23,855 cases in August of 2018. Uh, we did receive end-of-year budget reprogramming, which enabled us to significantly reduce the EQIP uh, front end inventory and ended the year with our smallest inventory on record of 2,980 cases. Uh, our FY18 metrics included uh, more than 263,000 industry case submittals, 95,000 interim determinations processed, uh, averaging 20 days, uh, and 108,000 knowledge center calls. Uh, FY19 is looking positive and we continue to drive towards a steady state of equip submissions, customer service and incident report processing. Questions? Steve DeMarco, DOD, CAP. I will be giving you the uh, status of the uh, CAS inventory for industry cases right now. As you can see from the slide here, uh, the inventory has doubled since the end of the third quarter. That's due to a number of factors. Uh, the factors are uh, MDIB has put additional resources in processing their, investigating their cases. Uh, that has caused a surge in the number of cases we're getting in. They have also implemented some additional measures to close their cases out. Uh, and again, that's also causing a surge. That's one reason. Uh, we've had ingest issues as far as the communications between MBIB and DMBC and making sure we're, we're getting all the cases in. They do the reconciliations and they find large numbers of cases that were not adjusted the way they were supposed to. We work with DMBC and MBIB, we get those cases and they put them in in large blocks. It could be tens of thousands of cases. So they're not coming in at a consistent level as well. Probably the longest poll in the tent for us right now is network issues or actually application issues. Uh, DSS or DISS, I should say, is not operating optimally for us. There's a lot of challenges with the workflows in DISS. Uh, we are seeing a reduced capacity in putting cases through uh, the system. Um, we are working with DMDC every day for change requests to try and get those workflows to be optimized. They're extremely rigid and we just can't process cases as quickly. Uh, but while we work with DMDC on those change requests, we are also looking internally as well. So we are looking to optimize our own internal processes. We are looking at potentially restructuring the way our divisions are set up. Um, we are going through and trying to change our processes to work with the system instead of having the system work for us. 
You know, it's, it's kind of backwards, but that's where we are, and that's what we're doing to try and change the, the situation. Fortunately, the trends you're seeing here are going to continue through fiscal year 2022. Uh, we expect our backlog to grow uh, tremendously over the next few years. Uh, we are programming for additional resources, uh, but as usual, resources take time to get. We have to program for them, they have to get approved, we have to go out and hire them, and then to train a fully functioning adjudicator takes us two years. So we have a lot of obstacles. We're working to overcome them every day, um, but that impacts our inventories, which will go up, our backlogs will go up, and our timelines are going to grow. Uh, you can see here in September, we were still, while we were above the mandated timeline, we were actually not doing so bad. Uh, the other good news is the industry, the industry portfolio is the healthiest portfolio right now within the CAF. Uh, so that's a good news story, uh, at least for industry, but that story is going to progressively get a little as we get more work in. Some of the key takeaways are, um, uh, when we shut down the legacy disco cats, uh, we we had some issues with the document migration. Those have been fixed, uh, so now we can request those documents. Uh, we have latency again, either network latency or application latency. Uh, we do not have le uh, access to legacy cats any longer, so anytime we do have missing documents, we have to put a request in. Uh, it is a button, and DMDC has been pretty good about getting those in within 24 hours. Uh, again, we continue to work in partnership with USDI, DVD, NBIB, uh, and we are trying to set up successfully to work these challenges, um, but it is going to take us some time to work through this inventory, um, and, uh, but we will work on it. We will we'll continue to get reports to let you know where we are on this. Um, uh, other than that, I'm just going to open up questions to see if anybody has anything. You're an A for your candor, no matter how depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a story. It's not necessarily a good news story. No, right that's now. true. Right. Well, as long as it's a story. Right. Questions? Thank you, Steve. That's good. I, mean, I appreciate that. Again, bleak, but, but true. All right. Uh, Terry, Russell. Hunter, Doha. Hmm? Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, actually a brief good news story because Doha does not have a backlog. The Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals obviously is the authority for denials or revocations in industry. Uh, right now we have less than 900 active cases and included among those are the roughly 130 uh, cases that are current in uh, legal reviews and current in getting cases hearing. Um, so we recognize that as uh, over the summer there was authority for granting uh, the ability to, for NBIB to close cases short and with the uh, introduction of much larger populations into continuous evaluation, um, it is likely that the workload hitting the DOD cap is going to, as Steve says, continue to increase. Um, the good news for us at, at Doha is one, we're, we're ready for whatever increase is coming at us because we do not have a backlog. The other good news is that historically over the last 30 years, the number of denials and revocations that have come out of either uh, the clearance application process or background investigations has been less than 2%. And so, as I've often said, the, uh, the purpose of the personnel security process is to look for the needle in the haystack, the bad actor who either is an insider threat or is somebody who should not have access, eligibility for access to classified information. And so as long as uh, we don't make the haystack bigger, the number of needles that we're catching uh, is going to remain relatively constant. So um, I'm optimistic, uh, especially because we're working with the DOD CAF and whatever problems you've heard about with DISS, they are not affecting us at Doha because we've worked with the CAF to work around that all of our due process cases directly from the CAF immediately. So there's happened with military and civilian cases. So uh, in that regard, um, industry is not only the healthiest portfolio at the CAF, but Doha is healthy in how we're working with the CAF to handle it. Any questions for uh, Perry? Uh, Perry, do, do you uh, foresee any 
in your process, the, the, the 2020, they're not going to, the, the cap is not going to be out of trouble until 2020. Do you first us to your organization moving forward? Uh, well, Doha receives what we receive. So um, I, I, I would say um, it would be impossible for it to not have some effect. Uh, but as of right now, because of the way we're working directly with the CAF on, on getting uh, the statements. And again, the statements of reason get a legal review at Bell. So we, we have sort of an early warning system there because we can see when we see an uptick in uh, draft statements of reasons, that tells us that we're going to be seeing more hearing cases down. And that while some number of people, after they get their statement of reasons, may decide to not go forward with the process, um, we, it's still a good early indicator. So, in a sense, the statement of reasons are like the canary in the coal mine. And so we have not yet seen uh, a major uptick in that. Um, when we do, we'll know that we need to get up for uh, what's coming next. Anyone else for Perry? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. No. Thank you. Okay, now we move into our open forum discussion, which uh, my favorite part of the show. So anyway, I mean, uh, please grab the mic and uh, say what you want to say. I'll put in a quick plug. Uh, December 6th, right here in this room, ISU is having a 40th anniversary half-day celebration. Uh, the primary focus, of course, is information security. We'll have all the uh, living ISU directors uh, present for a panel, as well as a keynote speaker. So uh, you're all invited. You can go to the uh, www.archives.gov forward slash ISU, or you could email Allegra, A-L-E-G-R-A dot Woodard at NARA dot gov if you would like to attend. It'll be in the morning. We'll have some cake and coffee and punch afterwards. So should be a good show. <laughs> Keith. Dennis Keith, Ms. Pack. I want to go back to um, just quickly a, a comment the Chair made earlier before we broke with regards to the uh, relative utility of this group. Uh, I feel pretty strongly that this group um, has a, a very important function uh, to perform for industry and U.S. government. And the primary purpose of that function is transparency. Uh, we have a governance problem right now with regards to how efficiently we tackle the issues. But the most important thing we do when we get together quarterly uh, is to be transparent with each other on solutions that are beneficial both for the government and for industry. To the degree that we're not doing that right now, we can fix that. It's our choice to fix that. And I believe, and I want to just attest to the leadership we have at the table there and their ability to address these issues uh, collaboratively and productively for industry. Well said. Yep, and I agree. Okay, well, there's no point in keeping uh, us here on a snowy day. I assume it's still snowing, but I don't know. Um, anyway, um, first NISPAC meeting for 2019, tentatively the date is March 13th here at the National Archives. Uh, we're going to try to acquire this theater in July and November and expect to have dates lined up in the next two weeks. You can imagine the reservations on this theater are, are tough. As mentioned earlier, announcements are made in the Federal Register about a month before each meeting, so that's where you can always uh, turn to. All right? Without that, without any further comment, uh, just, just one thing. Yeah. We know we had a few hiccups today, and uh, so we appreciate your feedback. Uh, <coughs> we would like to be more efficient and do this as best possible. So feel free to send me an email or Robert Tringali or Carolina Klink. Thanks. Please drive safely on your way out of here. Meeting adjourned. Nicely done. I thought your staff did a great job. Thanks. Thank you to all those who joined today's session. The session has completed and you may disconnect.